The United States presidential election of 1900 was the 29th quadrennial presidential election, held on Tuesday, November 6, 1900. In a rematch of the 1896 race, Republican President William McKinley defeated his Democratic challenger, William Jennings Bryan. McKinley's victory made him the first president to win consecutive re-election since Ulysses S. Grant had accomplished the same feat in 1872. McKinley and Bryan each faced little opposition within their own party. Although some gold Democrats explored the possibility of a campaign by Admiral George Dewey, Bryan was easily renominated at the 1900 Democratic National Convention after Dewey withdrew from the race. McKinley was unanimously renominated at the 1900 Republican National Convention. As Vice President Garrett Hobart had died in 1899, the Republican Convention chose New York Governor Theodore Roosevelt as McKinley's running mate. The return of economic prosperity and recent victory in the Spanish-American War helped McKinley to score a decisive victory, while Bryan's anti-imperialist stance and continued support for bimetallism attracted only limited support. McKinley carried most states outside of the Solid South and won 51.6% of the popular vote. The election results were similar to those of 1896, though McKinley picked up several western states and Bryan picked up Kentucky. McKinley was assassinated in September 1901 and was succeeded by Roosevelt. Nominations <inaudible> 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 Topic: Republican Party nomination. The 926 delegates to the Republican Convention, which met in Philadelphia on June 19 to 21, renominated William McKinley by acclamation. Thomas C. Platt, the boss of the New York State Republican Party, did not like Theodore Roosevelt, New York's popular governor, even though he was a fellow Republican. Roosevelt's efforts to reform New York politics, including Republican politics, led Platt and other state Republican leaders to pressure President McKinley to accept Roosevelt as his new vice presidential candidate, thus filling the spot left open when Vice President Garrett Hobart died in 1899. By electing Roosevelt vice president, Platt would remove Roosevelt from New York state politics. Although Roosevelt was reluctant to accept the nomination for vice president, which he regarded as a relatively trivial and powerless office, his great popularity among most Republican delegates led McKinley to pick him as his new running mate. Quite unexpectedly, Roosevelt would be elevated to the presidency in September 1901, when McKinley was assassinated in Buffalo, New York. Democratic Party nomination. Other candidates After Admiral George Dewey's return from the Spanish-American War, many suggested that he run for president on the Democratic ticket. Dewey, however, had already angered some Protestants by marrying the Catholic Mildred McLean Hazen the widow of General William Babcock Hazen and daughter of Washington McLean, owner of the Washington Post in November 1899 and giving her the house that the nation had given him following the war. His candidacy was also almost immediately plagued by a number of public relations gaffes. Newspapers started attacking him as naive after he was quoted as saying the job of president would be easy, since the chief executive was merely following orders in executing the laws enacted by Congress, and that he would "...execute the laws of Congress as faithfully as I have always executed the orders of my superiors." Shortly thereafter, he admitted never having voted in a presidential election before, mentioning that the only man he ever would have voted for, had he voted, would have been Grover Cleveland. He drew even more criticism when he offhandedly and prophetically told a newspaper reporter that, "...our next war will be with Germany." Dewey's campaign was met with a level of pessimism by gold Democrats on whose support his campaign depended. Some even threw their support to Bryan, since they believed him to be the stronger candidate. As early as three days into his candidacy, his campaign having been damaged by the aforementioned missteps, rumors abounded regarding Dewey's impending withdrawal which proved false. Further injuries, however, were made when it became clear that the Democratic Party leaders of Vermont were hostile to Dewey and wholly committed to Bryan. Ohio similarly went for Bryan, though with the caveat there that some leaders suggested that all mention to Silver in the party platform be dropped. 
By May 5, John Roll McLean, the brother-in-law of an effective campaign manager for Dewey, defected from the campaign and was widely considered to now be silently supporting Bryan. By May 17, Dewey recognized that there was very little chance for him to gather enough delegates among the western and southern states to possibly keep Bryan from attaining two-thirds of the delegates at the convention, publicly commenting that he no longer even knew why he had decided to run for president at all, he effectively withdrew around this time. After this there was a major boom for his nomination as vice president on the ticket alongside Bryan, however Dewey resolutely refused to be considered. William Jennings Bryan was faced with little real opposition after Dewey withdrew from the race. Bryan won at the 1900 Democratic National Convention held at Kansas City, Missouri, on July 4-6, garnering 936 delegate votes topping David B. Hill and Charles A. Town for the nomination. Source, U.S. President, D. Convention. Our Campaigns, March 10, 2011 Official or speculated candidates for the vice presidential nomination Topic. Populist Party nomination As the nation's third largest party, the populists had made an organizational decision in 1896 to fuse with the Democratic Party on the national level, their identity kept separate by the nomination of two different candidates for vice president. At the state level, local populist parties were left at liberty to proceed as they saw fit. In the Plains states, the populists fused with the Democrats, and in some states replaced them entirely. In the South, the populists fused with the Republican Party. The end result, though Bryan was defeated, was that the populists greatly enlarged their representation in Congress, from 10 to 26. In several southern states, however, the legislatures were still controlled by the Democrats, and they began passing a series of laws to eliminate the franchise for black voters, with the intention of undermining a significant block of the populist vote. The move had its intended consequences, as in the mid-term election of 1898, populist representation in the House of Representatives fell to nine, its lowest since the party's founding. The treatment of populists by the Democratic Party led to a division in the party. On May 17, 1899, Populist Party leaders met in St. Louis and issued an address calling for a middle-of-the-road policy, in which the party would decline future fusion efforts. The statement was primarily aimed at the party's national chairman, U.S. Senator Marion Butler of North Carolina, who had been elected to the Senate through fusion with North Carolina Republicans, and was already working for the renomination of William J. Bryan by the Populists in 1900. The pro-fusion leaders of the populists fought back in early 1900. The first state party known to have split was the Nebraska Party, which divided during its state convention on March 19. Both factions appointed delegates to the national convention, scheduled for Cincinnati. Ultimately, the fusion populists decided to hold a separate national convention when it became apparent that the Ohio populists did not favor fusion, and were working to organize a convention which would not nominate Bryan, but an independent ticket. Topic. Fusion Populist nomination The Fusion Populist National Convention assembled in a large tent just west of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, on May 9, and unanimously nominated Bryan for the presidency. Charles Town, the leader of the Silver Republican Party, was near unanimously nominated as his running mate, facing only weak opposition from Representative John Lentz from Ohio. When Adlai Stevenson won the Democratic vice presidential nomination over Charles Town, Town after withdrew from the race, with the fusion populists endorsing Stevenson. <laughs> <laughs> Middle of the road. Populist nomination. Meeting in Cincinnati, Ohio, the Middle of the Road. Faction adopted a platform that called for the creation of fiat money, government ownership of key industries, and the opening of conservation lands for economic development. Wharton Barker would be nominated for the presidency, while Ignatius Donnelly would be chosen as his running mate. <laughs> Minor party nominations Topic. Social Democratic Party nomination Social Democratic candidates Eugene V. 
Debs of Indiana, Union Leader Candidates Gallery The election of 1900 was the first United States election to feature a socialist candidate. The Socialist Labor Party of America found itself divided over the trade union policy as adopted at the 1896 National Convention, and by the brutal manner in which the party regulars maintained their influence. Many would leave and join with the fast-growing Social Democratic Party of America. At their party convention in Indianapolis, Indiana, Eugene V. Debs was nominated unanimously as the Social Democratic candidate for the presidency, the first of his five runs, with California lawyer Job Harriman nominated as his running mate. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Prohibition Party nomination. Prohibition candidates: John G. Woolley of Illinois, lawyer and public speaker. Silas C. Swallow of Pennsylvania, Methodist preacher Hale Johnson of Illinois, lawyer and former mayor Candidates gallery The Prohibition Party met in Chicago, Illinois on June 28 to nominate their presidential ticket. Hale Johnson, who had been their vice presidential nominee in 1896, withdrew his name immediately before the balloting was to begin. John G. Woolley was nominated on the first ballot, with Henry B. Metcalf of Rhode Island nominated to be his running mate in short order. <laughs> Anti-Imperialist League nomination League candidates William Jennings Bryan of Nebraska, Democratic presidential nominee in 1896 John B. Henderson of Missouri, former U.S. Senator Topic Candidates Gallery The American Anti-Imperialist League opposed the annexation of the Philippines it hoped to nominate a candidate who would run solely on the issue of anti-imperialism however the one candidate who had shown any promise the elderly former senator John Henderson of Missouri refused the Anti-Imperialist Party National Convention on August 15 divided over whether to nominate Bryan or introduce a third ticket. After a motion to nominate an independent ticket failed, Bryan and Stevenson were declared the nominees. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> National Party nomination. National Party candidates Edward Waldo Emerson of Massachusetts, writer and lecturer Donelson Caffrey of Louisiana, United States Senator Candidates gallery The National Party held its second and last national convention in the Carnegie Lyceum in New York City, with around 100 delegates present. The convention nominated Senator Donelson Caffrey of Louisiana for president and Archibald M. Howe, an attorney from Boston, Massachusetts, for vice president. However Caffrey, being a staunch Democrat, refused the nomination, and Howe removed himself soon after. Edward Waldo Emerson was hurriedly nominated in Donelson's place, but would only appear on the ballot in his native Massachusetts. Other nominations. The Union Reform Party nominated Seth H. Ellis of Ohio for president and Samuel T. Nicholson for vice president. The United Christian Party nominated Jonah F. R. Leonard for president, and David H. Martin for vice president. Initially, the party had nominated Silas C. Swallow for president and John G. Woolley for vice president, but both men refused, choosing instead to contest the Prohibition Party nomination of which Woolley would emerge the victor. General election Campaign The economy was booming in 1900, so the Republican slogan of, Four more years of the full dinner pail, combined with victory in the brief Spanish-American War in 1898, had a powerful electoral appeal. 
Teddy Roosevelt had become a national hero fighting in Cuba during the war, and as such he was a popular spokesman for the Republican ticket. Roosevelt proved highly energetic, and an equal match for William Jennings Bryan's famous barnstorming style of campaigning. Roosevelt's theme was that McKinley had brought America peace and prosperity and deserved re-election. In a whirlwind campaign, Roosevelt made 480 stops in 23 states. In his speeches, he repeatedly argued that the war had been just and had liberated the Cubans and Filipinos from Spanish tyranny. Four years ago the nation was uneasy because at our very doors an American island was writhing in hideous agony under a worse than medieval despotism. We had our Armenia at our threshold. The situation in Cuba had become such that we could no longer stand quiet and retain one shred of self-respect. We drew the sword and waged the most righteous and brilliantly successful foreign war that this generation has seen. Bryan's campaign was built around a reprise of his major issue from the 1896 campaign, Free Silver. It was not as successful in 1900, because prosperity had replaced severe depression and McKinley claimed credit. Advocates of enlarging the money supply to raise prices had to admit that a great deal of new gold was flowing into the world economy, and deflation i.e. falling prices was no longer a threat. Bryan's second major campaign theme attacked McKinley's imperialism. Bryan had supported the war, but opposed the annexation of the Philippines. He said McKinley had simply replaced a cruel Spanish tyranny with a cruel American one. Bryan was especially harsh in his criticisms of the American military effort to suppress a bloody rebellion by Filipino guerrillas. This theme won over some previous opponents, especially hard money, Germans, former gold Democrats, and anti-imperialists such as Andrew Carnegie. Both candidates repeated their 1896 campaign techniques, with McKinley campaigning again from the front porch of his home in Canton, Ohio. At the peak of the campaign, he greeted 16 delegations and 30,000 cheering supporters in one day. Meanwhile, Bryan took to the rails again, traveling 18,000 miles to hundreds of rallies across the Midwest and East. This time, he was matched by Theodore Roosevelt, who campaigned just as energetically in 24 states, covering 21,000 miles by train. The triumph of the American Army and Navy in the war against Spain was a decisive factor in building Republican support. Democrats tried to argue that the war was not over because of the insurgency in the Philippines, this became their major issue. A perception that the Philippine-American War was coming to an end would be an electoral asset for the Republicans, and the McKinley administration stated that there were reductions of troops there. Republicans pledged that the fighting in the Philippines would die down of its own accord within 60 days of McKinley's re-election. However, as one lieutenant explained in a letter to his wife, it looks good on paper, but there really has been no reduction of the force here. These battalions being sent home are made up on men, about to be discharged." In addition, Secretary of War Elihu Root had a report from MacArthur of September 1900 that he did not release until after the election. General Arthur MacArthur, Jr., had been in command of the Philippines for four months, warning Washington that the war was not lessening and that the end was not even in sight. MacArthur believed that the guerrilla stage of the war was just beginning and that Filipinos were refining their techniques through experience. Furthermore, Philippine leader Emilio Aguinaldo's strategy had popular support. MacArthur wrote, The success of this unique system of war depends upon almost complete unity of action of the entire native population. That such unity is a fact is too obvious to admit of discussion, how it is brought about and maintained is not so plain. Intimidation has undoubtedly accomplished much to this end, but fear as the only motive is hardly sufficient to account for the united and apparently spontaneous action of several millions of people. One traitor in each town would eventually destroy such a complex organization. It is more probable that the adhesive principle comes from ethological homogeneity, which induces men to respond for a time to the appeals of consanguineous leadership even when such action is opposed to their interests and convictions of expediency. Nonetheless, the majority of soldiers in the Philippines did not support Bryan. Any mention of the election of 1900 in the soldiers' letters and diaries indicated overwhelming support for the Republican ticket of McKinley and Roosevelt. According to Sergeant Beverly Daly, even the "'Howling Democrats' favored McKinley. Private Hambleton wrote, "'Of course, there are some boys who think Bryan is the whole cheese, but they don't say too much.'" 
Despite Bryan's energetic efforts, the renewed prosperity under McKinley, combined with the public's approval of the Spanish–American War, allowed McKinley to gain a comfortable victory. Results It is a matter of considerable importance that Theodore Roosevelt, the vice presidential candidate on the Republican ticket, attracted unusual attention in the campaign, and it has been commonly asserted that he brought a considerable number of votes to the Republican ticket. McKinley polled roughly 7,200,000 votes. He carried 28 states with a combined 292 electoral votes 65.32%. He slightly increased his national percentage 51.60% with 120,000 more votes than in 1896. This change is reflected in the gains made in number of counties carried. McKinley had 222 more counties than he had carried in 1896, thus gaining a slight majority of the total number of counties making returns in 1900. Of the 2,729 counties making returns, McKinley won in 1,385 50.75% while Bryan carried 1,340 49.10%. Two counties were split evenly between McKinley and Bryan, while two counties in Texas recorded more votes cast for «others» than either of the two party candidates. McKinley had a majority in 1,288 counties while Bryan had a majority in 1,253 counties. Further examination reveals that changes in counties were even more impressive. Of the 2,729 counties making returns, 2,286 were identical in these two elections, 113 changed from Republican to Democratic, and 328 changed from Democratic to Republican. A notable feature was the Bryan gains made in the New England and Northeastern Mid-Atlantic sections, with also a slight gain in the East-North-Central section. Bryan even managed to win New York City by almost 30,000 votes when he had lost it by more than 60,000 votes just four years earlier. In all other sections, Bryan's vote was less than in 1896, and in the nation his total vote was 23,000 less than in 1896. The percentage of total was 45.52, a slight loss. Kentucky, which he carried this time, showed an increase of 17,005. In 16 states, the Democratic vote increased, but in 29 states it was less than in 1896. Bryan carried only 17 states. This was the last election in which the Republicans won the majority of electoral votes in Maryland until 1920 and the last in which the Democrats won Idaho, Missouri, and Montana until 1912. It is also the last election in which a Republican won the presidency without winning Idaho and Montana. Source, Popular Vote, Lape, David. 1900 Presidential Election Results. Dave Lape's Atlas of U.S. Presidential Elections. Retrieved July 28, 2005. Source: Electoral Vote. Electoral College Box Scores 1789 to 1996. National Archives and Records Administration. Retrieved July 31, 2005. Topic: <laughs> Geography of Results. Topic. Cartographic gallery Topic. Results by state Topic. Close states Margin of victory less than 5% 42 electoral votes Kentucky, 1.71% Utah, 2.29% Nebraska, 3.24% Idaho, 3.83% Indiana, 3.99% Margin of victory between 5% and 10% 150 electoral votes Maryland, 5.27% Missouri, 5.53% Kansas, 6.60% Ohio, 6.64% Tennessee, 8.08% Illinois, 8.39% North Carolina, 8.46% 
Delaware, 8.77%, New York, 9.27%, West Virginia, 9.52%. Statistics Counties with highest percent of vote Republican. Keweenaw County, Michigan 92.24% Leslie County, Kentucky 91.23% Unicoi County, Tennessee 89.64% Scott County, Tennessee 89.59% Johnson County, Tennessee 89.20% counties with highest percent of vote Democratic. Erion County, Texas 100.00% Hampton County, South Carolina 99.89% Greenwood County, South Carolina 99.73% Saluda County, South Carolina 99.45% Abbeville County, South Carolina 99.42% counties with highest percent of vote other Carson County, Texas 78.71% Chambers County, Texas 44.50% Comanche County, Texas 32.82% Franklin County, Georgia 30.92% Scurry County, Texas 28.69% counties with lowest percent of vote Republican Randall County, Texas 0%, Erion County, Texas 0%, Hampton County, South Carolina 0.11%, Greenwood County, South Carolina 0.27%, Dooley County, Georgia 0.35% counties with lowest percent of vote Democratic, Keweenaw County, Michigan 6.33%, Unicoi County, Tennessee 8.29%. Leslie County, Kentucky 8.46% Scott County, Tennessee 10.23% Johnson County, Tennessee 10.42% counties with most votes Republican Cook County, Illinois 203,760 Philadelphia County, Pennsylvania 173,657 New York County, New York 153,001 Kings County, New York 108,977 Allegheny County, Pennsylvania 71,780 counties with most votes Democratic Cook County, Illinois 186,193 New York County, New York 181,786 Kings County, New York 106,232 Philadelphia County, Pennsylvania 58,179 Suffolk County, Massachusetts 47,534 counties with most votes other New York County, New York 11,700 Cook County, Illinois 10,242 Milwaukee County, Wisconsin 5,857 Kings County, New York 4,639 Essex County, Massachusetts 4,242 counties with lowest percent of vote and win Republican. Cherokee County, Alabama 41.94% Paulding County, Georgia 46.00% Logan County, Colorado 46.59% Chattahoochee County, Georgia 47.18% Otter Tail County, Minnesota 47.19% counties with lowest percent of vote and win Democratic Murray County, Georgia 45.18% Geneva County, Alabama 46.48% Douglas County, Georgia 46.75% Lynn County, Oregon 46.77% Fresno County, California 47.41% See also History of the United States 1865-1918 Newspaper endorsements in the United States presidential election, 1900 United States House elections, 1900 United States Senate elections, 1900 Second inauguration of William McKinley <laughs>